discuss uh, geopolitical impacts of uh, the current pandemic and uh, we have four very good speakers with us today. Uh, we have Augusto Teixeira from the Federal University of Paraíba, who I thank you a lot for participating. We have Ashok Swain uh, from the Uppsala University. We have Shashi Jayakumar, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, Shashi, uh, from uh, the Nanyang uh, Technological University, and Tomonori uh, Yoshizaki from the, in, from the Japanese MOD. Uh, very different perspectives, uh, very different subjects they will address. So I think we'll have a very uh, complete and a very uh, interesting discussion. I thank you all of you for accepting the invitation. Uh, this is a very uh, I'll, I'll say interesting moment, but uh, very sad also with a lot of deaths, uh, deaths worldwide. A lot of people are worried about this, uh, and they are correct uh, in this worries. Here in Brazil, unfortunately, we have a president that has been minimizing the effects of the, the of the virus, but uh most of the population are, are very concerned and respecting the uh, quarantine and and uh staying at home so i would like to to hear about the different perspectives uh that you have on these uh, issues and how uh you've been feeling uh the problems related to it uh, but mainly how do you think that uh, this is going to change our lives uh how this is going to change international relations, the balance of power, uh, the balance of power between especially uh, the United States and uh, China, uh, how the, the communication technologies that we currently use are affecting our behaviors and can affect uh, the mini future as well. Uh, I would first start with Augusto, who's to give us a, a broader perspective of geopolitics and how he's been seeing this, these events. And then if, if uh, that's okay with you, uh, I would pass the floor to, to Ashok and then to Shashi and, uh, and Tomonori. Um, I can, can give Shashi the last will and Shashi is gonna give us a uh, more specific perspective on uh, new technologies and how he's been seeing things. Um, so uh, let me pass the floor to Augusto uh, like for, for attending. The I think your mic is off, Augusto. Good morning. morning. Everyone can, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we do. Okay, so first of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this. I would like to start the, my, my speak, my presentation by thanking Juliano for uh, his great idea and his efforts to of bringing us all together this morning uh, to discuss probably the most important issue of our days, uh, not only to debate coronavirus and his impacts, but mainly uh, how it affects geopolitics and probably how we will uh, change the geopolitical landscape in the, in the years to come. So uh, just introducing myself quickly, I am a professor here in Brazil in Federal University of Paraíba, and I'm also an, an analyst in, at the Army Center for Strategic Studies and in an institute for the studies of the United States uh, here in Brazil. So uh, my area of study is mainly about geopolitics, strategic studies, and the understanding of how uh, geopolitical competition, mainly great power competition, affects Brazil and the region mainly. So in that sense, my presentation is going to, uh, to try to set, shed light mainly in three aspects of, the, of those issues. First of all, the idea of how the current crisis involving COVID-19 happens in the context that we are already uh, living 
uh, deep changes in international relations, international order, mainly in the balance of power nowadays. A second issue, important issue in the way I see, is how uh, the current crisis uh, is maybe a catalyst for increasing uh, depth and intensity of great power competition that will mainly not only affect every country on the world, but maybe can uh, give an answer, a more acute answer in the sense of how polarity will be designed and managed uh, in the years to come. And the last issue that I would like to address here is about uh, how the crisis and the changes in geopolitics may affect uh, Brazil and its region, especially in the context that we have now a, a government and a foreign policy that is highly heterodoxical in the sense of uh, what's Brazilian uh, diplomatic tradition. Well, that being said, uh, the first issue that I would like to address is uh, how uh, the current crisis happens and it's important to uh, bring some context to it in the sense of deep and more broad transformation that was already going on. The first of all is the idea of multipolarity, especially in the sense that previous to the crisis, we are were already living in a context of diffuse or no resolved polarity in the sense that the unipolar moments that we lived on the 90s maybe uh, was already coming to an end. Uh, the rise of China, the emergence of Russia, the capacity of other countries, important countries, to be resolute in regional contexts, all of that was changing the ge geopolitical chessboard. In that sense, uh, highly important is the US-China confrontation, not only to uh, better understand polarity in that sense, but how the COVID-19 crisis impacts that confrontation, which some uh, authors were starting to say that probably we could have a, a new Cold War or a second Cold War uh, based on US and China rivalry that could uh, bring all worlds on that structural confrontation in the future. A second issue on that is the idea that, that the nature of the ongoing course of uh, transformation in global order uh, shows a deep problem in terms of the sustentation of the uh, liberal order that once the United States was the main keeper. In that sense, uh, what are going to be the inputs in a world that the order is being not only eroded, but its main gatekeeper, the US, is not on to that job today. In that sense, will China try to give uh, inputs to a new world order, or she will try to other countries to make maintain what is left of the old liberal order that was interesting for her interests uh, previously. In that sense, the confrontation that was in, uh, on, ongoing previous to the pandemic and its main uh, catalyst effects can uh, bring uh, huge effects not only to the world scenario and to its geopolitics, but also to Brazil and the region. Uh, Brazil and its region uh, are mainly in a peripheric area of the world system. So normally, uh, global trends and tendencies uh, have a huge delay in coming to here, but not in terms of geopolitics, because uh, in the last years, Russia has been an important actor in Latin American geopolitics, not only in Venezuela, but, all, but also in Nicaragua and Cuba, especially in a trying to uh, balance the US with soft power in the region. In other sense, China has been a fundamental actor, not only in economic growth in Latin America, but also in investment, and fundamentally in a way that it can help to shape geopolitical and geoeconomic environment here in Latin America in with direct uh, impacts uh, towards Brazil. In that sense, the crisis, the current crisis of COVID-19 uh, gives a 
big uh, uh, issue and problem on how hemispheric relations, especially with the U.S. and its neighbors in Latin America, especially Brazil, will uh, handle the crisis, especially the issue of China in the region. Because uh, for the U.S., the China-U.S. rivalry is not only a centerpiece in a, in a new strategic reasoning in the sense of trying to think how we will build a coherent strategy to address these changes in world order, but the hemispheric arena in Latin America mainly is seen on a, a background in which uh, global powers uh, are tending to act and especially balance the U.S. really near to its continental territory, which is a symbolic uh, threat to its uh, liberty of uh, action uh, in terms of geopolitics, fundamentally. In that sense, that being said, the crisis uh, is not only a catalyst for ongoing changes, mainly on multipolarity, mainly on rivalry, and mainly on problems, of uh, a conflict in worldwide, but it's all. Uh, but is the crisis is also a problem in terms of how to reorient strategic thinking and politics uh, during a pandemic that is accelerating uh, uh, international relations. In that sense, uh, that is really a problem in the sense of how. Uh, the pandemics will affect not only global geopolitics, but how the countries or great powers will react to that. But for uh, an issue from, uh, in that sense is the fact that the timing of the crisis is probably awful to all great, pro uh, great powers uh, in the chessboard. For the U.S., for instance, uh, it can bring uh, huge problems to Trump re-election, especially about, uh, in terms of the critique related for his delay or failure in terms to response uh, internally to the crisis that can be, uh, can be a huge problem for him uh, in, in the months to come. For Russia, the pandemic brings huge problem in the sense of the freezing of the process of the constitutional reform uh, pretended by, uh, by Putin this year, so it can be, uh, bring a backlash in terms of results of political uh, uh, changes inside Russia that cannot be, that will probably not be uh, really good for Trump for, for Putin in the months to come. And for China, uh, the, the pandemic uh, gives a, a very uh, a problematic economic scenario uh, not only for short term, but for long term, if we remember that Chinese uh, economic growth was uh, co co uh, coming to be uh, much lower in the past years. And the main impact of the pandemic and the disruption of economic and market supply chains can be a huge problem, not only for economy, but for trust and for economic and industrial structure uh, centered in China as it may pull. In that sense, the pandemic hits hard and hits very hard, not only the US, but also China and also Russia, the main actors in this multipolar structure that is bringing to life. In that sense, uncertainty is the main uh, uh, issue and main characteristic that is structure uh, world during the pandemic in a world post-pandemic, because it's not uh, easy or able uh, to say really uh, uh, or to give answers in the sense of how long the pandemic is going to last or uh, which will be its effects post-crisis, especially in terms of multipolarity or the, in the, capa the capability of the countries to address the effects of the crisis. In that sense, the pandemic it's not necessarily altering or changing the nature of geopolitics, but is uh, more rather uh, changing geopolitical landscape, changing the geopolitical landscape uh, as a catalyst of showing uh, that great power competition has come to stay, that the world in the 21st century post-pandemic 
probably can be more similar to the world of geopolitics of the 19th century with balance of power, with difficulties uh, uh, in terms of uh, a liberal order, cosmopolitan order to address uh, problems uh, commonly. In that sense, uh, what are the strategic implications in the near future, not only for China, Russia and the United States, but also to middle powers, regional powers like Brazil? Uh, one of the issues is mainly the idea that how the U.S. is going to respond to the China uh, confrontation, to the China challenge, and how we will impact Brazil in Latin America. That's really important because it's an issue not only of politics, but it's all, uh, uh, also an issue of timing. Because for our president in Brazil, President Bolsonaro, uh, not the, the, it's not only the U.S. is that important, but the, the figure of President Trump is not only a, a symbolic asset for Bolsonaro, but is, is, a, is seen as a safety uh, 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 issue in terms for uh, the coherence of his kind of government and his kind of international uh, insertion, uh, despite the fact that probably Brazil today does not have a strategic uh, a strategy on how it's going to manage international relations and what it wants in international relations currently. That being said, uh, the, the crisis of COVID-19 is the first global crisis that uh, the Trump administration is facing. So uh, Obama had the, the 2008 crisis, Trump has not had 9-11, Trump is, uh, is having now uh, the COVID-19 crisis that may not kill so many Americans as it will kill people in other places. Uh, now uh, the U.S. is the main epicenter of the pandemic, but it will give a huge impact not only internally in terms of account accountability and, pro and uh, probable uh, electoral process, but it also will uh, change geopolitical landscape as we are seeing uh, nowadays. In that sense, the impact on not only on U.S. election can bring huge changes and impact to all Latin America and also to Brazil, especially in terms that probably the U.S. will be an economic partner in terms of reconstruction of the economic impacts of the crisis in Latin America or in Brazil. In that context, uh, a country like Brazil that has a, an economic mindset that we can call neoliberal in that sense, uh, hoped a lot that economic economies like the US and European uh, economies could be of help in terms of economic reform, privatization, things like that. Uh, after the crisis, uh, or in the fact of the post-crisis, uh, probably the U.S. won't be uh, refrained of help in that, in that sense. Uh, so that place, China in the region, can be seen as an important asset in, in terms of building a strategy of exit in terms of the main impact of the crisis. And that's a really big problem, not only to Brazil in the sense of how to modulate its discourse in terms of being anti-China for the domestic audience, more of the uh, right audience of the electorate into the US. And in the other time, it has to be pro-China in the sense of giving, giving answers to its agro-industry and its sectors that are more pragmatic. In that sense, how Brazil is going to manage a strategic uh, reasoning that can uh, 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 give answers to both the US and both to China in the sense that is hugely dependent on China, not necessarily on the US. In that sense, regionally, how Brazil will solve the issue will probably give uh, uh, inputs to how other countries in the region will address China and US rivalry in the world post-COVID-19. Because if we see uh, the, the Venezuela crisis has had created a structure of alignment in Latin America that opposes normally the countries that are pro-Maduro and the countries that are against Maduro that mainly uh, is related to 
pro-US uh, position or pro-China and Russia position in the region. So uh, previous to COVID-19, and I think that COVID-19 will accelerate, be a catalyst, magnifier to that process, maybe we, will, we can be drawn to a structure of not necessarily bipolar structure, but to uh, assume more rigid alignments in terms of international politics, especially for countries that do not have strategic autonomy uh, in the sense of saying no in international politics. In that sense, Brazil situation post-crisis is, uh, 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 is imperial in terms of uh, its space of maneuver in terms of how it can uh, address its problems in the lack of a, a coherent strategy in terms of how we are going to uh, come out of this crisis. In that sense, my uh, final remarks uh, about the issue is in, if we think about the COVID-19 crisis, one of the main issues uh, that can help countries in that crisis is the how fast they react to the crisis. Uh, the worst strategy is having no strategy. So Brazil, for instance, has today no strategy because uh, we have the, in the business, Minister of Health a strategy in the government, we have another view, another idea on how to address the issue. In that sense, uh, our inexistent uh, national strategy on how to deal with the crisis and how to deal with the international impacts of it, uh, it may give a, a huge uh, deepen or deepen our problem in terms of how to uh, produce a way out of the crisis, especially how to deal with the US and how to deal with China. That's already a problem now and will be a huge problem in the months to come, especially after the US elections and what we will have uh, of that. In that sense, uh, geopolitics, in my way of view, is not changing its nature, just like politics, but geopolitical landscape is not changing radically towards a path that we do not know. Probably the path is the one that was already uh, in set some decades ago, when we have probably the return of geopolitics as a force in terms of organizing international relations in a world more normal with global confrontation and competition uh, between global powers that will organize the world to come. Okay, well, uh, that was some of my uh, initial remarks on, about more systemic approach. Uh, it will be a huge pleasure to hear you and especially to learn uh, on our debate. Thank you, Juliano, for the, for the invitation, especially for the opportunity uh, to be here with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Augusto. Uh, I'll pass the floor to Ashok. Good, good afternoon, Ashok. It's uh, almost 9 a.m. here, uh, but I know that you're in a much better time zone than we are for this conference. I think you, you are uh, uh, the most fortunate one here since it's night in Asia uh, and it's early in the morning for us. I think it's I so live much in Europe. I live in Europe, so that's why they fix the time beforehand. You know, it's a privilege to be part of the colonial era <clears throat> or a region. So, no, Thank I you so much for the invitation, and I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you, Juliano. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, um, and uh, thank you for organizing this meeting, meeting old friends, and also some new ones. And I think it's a very important topic to discuss at this point of time. Um, I agree mostly with Augusto what how the uh, scenario will be developing, particularly the in the context of global politics. Uh, I will come to that. I have a uh, I have a little bit different take, but overall I agree uh, what he said. Uh, as I say it, uh, the uh, the whole coronavirus crisis had given the world a very big opportunity to come together. Uh, because uh, there has been in the last few years, we have seen the world is moving in a direction, uh, particularly the countries uh, moving from um, coming uh, together. They instead uh, decided uh, to be more nationalistic approach. The nationalist, nationalism became the kind of uh, 
the word in, uh, in 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 many parts of the world nationalist leaders came to power so uh, instead of uh, coming together as a, as a as a as a global society which we thought that in the post cold war period in the 90s the hope was it was started uh, going um, in a different direction for the for the last few years uh, but this had provided uh, but we didn't take this uh, the climate change which had given this possibility of coming together, but we didn't take that because climate change probably was, you, you could think that, you know, the repercussions, it's a, it's a impact probably uh, were, would have been a bit uh, in the future. So probably we could just, we are not exactly taking into that future because the present day politics will taking the, uh, the leaders are more active. But the crisis like coronavirus crisis, which is a huge pandemic uh, where everyone is affected and you expect the world to come together, but it hasn't taken place. And that's what I think uh, I, I see a big opportunity uh, the world has uh, lost in this way. Uh, that's also saying that I, I see it also that is a different countries will have the different ways to address it. Some will be more successful than others. Uh, it's not the uh, only rich countries will be more successful than poor countries. Some rich countries are also having problems of getting that kind of uh, addressing this issue. And I think the three key factors, which are very, very important for understanding which country will be successful of addressing this issue um, in, in, in a better way. Of course, this, is, this will be creating a huge humanitarian issues, but who will be much more resilient to address this? And I think then we need to look at it. You need to have a good leader uh, in this kind of scenario. You need to have strong institutional abilities of the country or the state or the region. Then also if the society with good social capital. These three things, if combined together, even if a country is poor, it might be able to resilient enough to address this system. What has happened, um, I think, we are seeing because of thanks to the uh, rise of nationalism in the last few years, we have fought the leaders who have been have the serious problems as a, considered as a good leader who can bring their country together. Even if you are looking at a country based approach instead of looking at a global approach at the country level, also these these leaders because they are nationalists, they, are, they come with a certain kind of divisive agenda, so they have not really able to build the country together. And I think that's where we will see many of the countries where these kind of so-called strong men are in power have really failed to produce good results because they first started uh, not accepting that this is a crisis because that didn't really fit into their kind of political agenda. After some time, when they realize that this has become a crisis, they are started also acting onto this, not with a particularly taking the country together, creating a cohesive agenda, just making a politics out of it, how they can politically benefit out of this, rather taking the country uh, to face the crisis. And I think this is where I th we do, and, and this nationalism, uh, the nationalist leaders are not only confined to a rich countries, they have been everywhere, uh, including Brazil, also country where I come from, India. So I think we 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 uh, we need to look at it how that factor uh, plays. Uh, we have also seen uh, well the well the strong men leaders, so-called strong men leaders, have generally failed to deliver or to address this issue. We have we are also seeing many women leaders in the countries. They are becoming successful. We have good success stories in New Zealand. We have success stories, which is in Finland. We have some success stories in Germany. There are, you invariably, the women leaders have done much better than this so-called strong men leader. And I think something we need to realize that this is where we, we need to be, uh, see that how that leadership is, is, is important at this point of time when the country faces a crisis of this nature. It's the time when you need to be compassionate, you need to be considerate, you need to be bring country together, not to divide it further, not to act ham-handed way, not to do it only for the political, your own political uh, 
interest. And I think this is this is where uh, we have to look at it, how these countries will be uh, at least addressing this crisis. Going back to the global stage, um, uh, the, there, there, was a, there was a big hope that this is the time when the free world or the leader of the free world, which is the United States, will come uh, and uh, really address this issue in a way because, uh, because that's the time when a, a free world should come to the front, uh, led by the United States, uh, which has been done for the last 50, 70, 80 years. So I think we were expecting that to happen, but that hasn't happened. Uh, that again comes from the bad leadership, but also the political uncertainty and the coming elections makes it much more further problematic. Uh, so United States, instead of uh, taking this uh, role uh, as a uh, leader of taking this uh, uh, free world together, creating a global leadership has felt in this scenario. At the same time, European Union, uh, which had ambition for the last uh, few uh, months or years uh, to replace to somehow or to, uh, to fill in the gap which has been created because of the, uh, uh, the uh, Donald Trump's uh, different type of uh, policies, which is not exactly America is playing that role. But then in Europe now has been divided more than ever. Uh, that uh, you, you will see uh, different countries are facing the crisis. Uh, the whole idea of this uh, European identity has gone somewhere. Now the national identity has come. It's a, each and everyone is blaming others. Everyone is saying that the European Union is absent of taking care of them, particularly the countries those who are recently joined. So there has been a lot, of, and also Southern European countries. So the European Union has also failed to come together to meet this crisis or at least to give the leadership what has been um, United States failed and the European Union has also failed. So then what has left with us? We have got the, uh, the China, which of course got the crisis the first, which was the where the, but then we have started only uh, the, uh, we, we needed to see because that of course there has been some kind of criticism of China how it handled in the beginning, uh, in the first uh, few months or past uh, one or one and a half months, uh, the way of uh, we are, uh, you know, hiding the information, uh, uh, taking strong measures or uh, undemocratic measures, particularly uh, against the people those who are with the doctors, uh, and not sharing the information. That that's of course the case which comes up. So there has been a lot of criticism about China, but what has happened in recent um, um, weeks? that China has recovered. China has uh, recovered from that crisis quite, quite, quite uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more spectacularly than what anyone could expect. Uh, it has been trying to fill in the gap, which has been the global, in the, at the global level where the United States and the European Union have failed. So it is, it is providing all kinds of uh, financial, medical, uh, even the doctors and nurses, it is providing everywhere in the world. Uh, and I think that's where uh, the China is getting into, into that kind of feeling in the leadership role, which the free world uh, re leaders really uh, almost gave it in a, uh, um, in a, quite comfortably to China. So China is, is, is playing that quite uh, smartly at this point of time, as I see it. Of course, we know that China has on the economic power. China had certain kind of political power, particularly it's a, it's a hist historical friendship, as well as being is a permanent member in the Security Council. China is pro progressing very well on the uh, military power front. Uh, it used to be an importer of uh, military hardware, now fifth, fourth and fifth uh, military exporter, uh, uh, creating quite a big advance in creating the, the military industry in itself. Uh, so I don't see any problem China becoming a real military power sooner to really, uh, you know, uh, to become a major, major, major challenge to the military power being now at the hand of the United States. But the only, the, the real problem for the countries is does China have the moral power to lead the world or to be a face of the, uh, that kind of filling in the gap which has been um, uh, given um, quite 
uh, comfortable to them at this point of time. We do see that China doesn't have that. China, the way China addressed the crisis, the way China is addressing the crisis at present at home, it doesn't give any kind of, of uh, comfort to anyone that China will able to lead the world or China even aspire to become a, another major power center which can really lead in a politically and morally to this world. Uh, the way China, China, inside China, the attacks are taking place now on Africans. That's what the scary part. I mean, the whole world is blaming China of, uh, uh, for, the, for the corona crisis, and the Chinese are blaming Africans in China for the corona crisis. And that's something which you will see that what kind of mindset, what kind of political, social uh, um, the groupings we are really going to deal with in, 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 the, in, the, in the future. So, this is this is a kind of scenario. Scenario is, as I see it, that will be a China will be an upper hand, will be get get an upper hand in the global politics. But the problem is, is for the world, China doesn't have the moral uh, authority or the moral compass, uh, the right moral compass to lead it. Um, then we, how we will see the other problem com coming up? Uh, there will be in search of economic recovery post COVID world. Uh, there will be a huge economic crisis. Of course, economic crisis, job crisis, food crisis, these are the crises which we need to really keep it in mind when, when, if and when, when we'll recover from this uh, coronavirus crisis. Um, and that, that the, 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 it, the, the kind of things which are, the world had made certain progress of protecting environment, of protecting, creating, taking measures of at least environmentally be sustainable, because of the climate change, that will be sacrificed. Because we, or the countries, many countries will try to go for various kind of rapid economic uh, stability, and that will sacrifice quite a big way the kind of interest, the kind of groups, those who were really made an impact of protecting the environment. And that's also quite scary part. The scary part is that we, after the corona crisis, in just to recover, we will probably keep on destroying more and more environment. And that's if that will also further complicate the, our climate change issue. And I think we need to be really careful and at the same time look at it, how that will lead to. What will happen to the political side? Um, dictators love crisis. We know that. And they are loving it. In many countries, these bad leaders, the who had come, they're loving this crisis. That has given them the possibility of to capture more and more power. It is. It has happened in 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 a country. I mean, look at how the Trump is trying to deal with it. How the it's in Hungary taking place. What is happening in India? I I will I keep. I mean, China of course. It was never a democratic country, but the country kind of countries where you would expect that uh, the, the, these kind of dictators or those who are hidden um, behind a democratic facade now come out quite openly. They have got exactly the power and possibility or the legitimacy to take away certain kind of personal uh, liberty and the possibility of uh, they can enter into all kinds of uh, snooping and all sorts of things to the, uh, the personal liberty side. And I think that's where the grabbing of power taking place or will take place much more by these kind of dictators. Um, and that's that's also, we will, I mean, the democracy was declining in the world in the last few, uh, last decade, and it will further take the declining stage uh, in the, in the post-corona crisis. Uh, and I think this is where we need to also look at it, how that will be um, moving on. Um, then uh, the it's 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 it's, a, it's a some things which we have been allowed to blame on others instead of really looking at the crisis, what really brought it, what exact learning from it. We are only blaming each other. Uh, Trump blames or China, China blames Africa, Indians blame Muslims. You name it. Everyone and the Europeans blame migrants. You just name what kind of things going on. This kind of blaming doesn't really help. In India, India, I will just take a few minutes just to look at, to take you to the Indian scenario. India, the, the, I think uh, uh, the Brazilian president calls Indian prime minister, his elder brother, 
So you can imagine what kind of Indian prime minister we have got. Um, so this, the kind of uh, person he is, he was, of course, in the beginning, he didn't really uh, accept that was a crisis. It was a kind of soft going, going on. And suddenly, with a four hours of notice, he went for 40 days of lockdown of a country like Indian size. And where millions of migrant workers, millions of homeless people, millions of poor people that you survive only for that day. 200 million people don't have enough food, even in any regular time. And you do that kind of lockdown without proper planning, without proper actions. And then how, you, the, how to hide your failure? The how to hide your failure is to blame Muslims. That's the very easy way. When you fail something, you blame someone else. And this is where I think we, we, we are leading to into this kind of scenario where it's a, instead of finding uh, right solutions, instead of getting to the uh, problem, we are trying to blame each other. And because, because that's where we are hiding. And I think that's also giving these kind of bad leaders, which I started in the beginning, the possibility of hiding their failures, which they have done on economic front, they have done on social front, they have done on the policy front, they have done on the governance front. Now they will take this corona crisis to capture or keep the more power. Because even if they hold the elections, it's usually at the time of crisis, usually the, the countries or the people don't want to change the leader. So we see that kind of things coming up. Um, so I think probably I have taken more time than what I, I, I'm supposed to, but what I would say at the end is that uh, I, I am more, more, much more worried about the post-COVID world than the present COVID world, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's a scary, it's a extremely painful, it's a very disturbing, but we must, as, 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 uh, 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 to be conscious that this is not going to be over once the COVID is over. It's getting, going to get much worse. Uh, and I think the world has, as I understand, uh, particularly the free world has lost a big opportunity of coming together, putting a strong leadership and taking the world in a towards a better future. Thank you, uh, Juliano. I will stop here for the time being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashok. I like your optimism. Uh, you're very happy about, about the way things are, uh, apparently. <laughs> Uh, uh, without further delay, I'll pass the word. Uh, the, the, I'll pass the floor to to Tom Onori. Uh, yep. Tom, uh, a lot for accepting the invitation. Uh, good night to you. I know it's very late in Japan. You must be tired. Uh, so uh, I thank you uh, again for for accepting. Uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuliano. It's my great pleasure to join this very important meeting. And uh, let me start with a uh, story about Brazil. Four years back, Brazil hosted the big, big world event, Olympic Games. And do you remember that the Prime Minister Abe had a uh, costume, which is um, um, the uh, in uh, the, the Olympic Games, uh, he was in uh, Super Mario. He tried to have a kind of fun at the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games four years later. Now, this is a year of the Tokyo Olympic Games, but it cancelled last month. And we were waiting up until the mid-March, and uh, we were very optimistic. And we tried to host the big world premiere, the event like a Tokyo Olympic Games and Paralympics starting from July. But the, this is suspended, zero possibility of having Olympic Games. And one year later, we have, we have a, one, more, one more year preparations. So far, 3,000 Japanese companies canceled the uh, constructions and events. So huge economic impact. Nobody there to talk about the Tokyo Olympic Games anymore. So that means optimism four years back in Rio de Janeiro, Rio de, Rio de Rio, it's gone completely. So now we have to think about the realistic um, the uh, future. Last week, 
Japanese government proposed to have an economic package, uh, which is about one trillion U.S. dollars, one trillion U.S. dollars, which is about twenty percent, twenty percent of the our GDP. This is economic stimuli in order to overcome ongoing and uh, the future uh, economic crisis. But the point is, uh, we don't know how much we don't know. This is the unknown unknowns is everywhere. We don't know when the pandemics or coronavirus crisis will be over, July, September, this year, or next year, we don't know, actually. And according to the IMF, the economic outlook, okay, they are very sincere that uh, uh, minus 3%, the uh, minus growth of, the, of this year. This is a 6% down from the previous uh, assessment. That's the reality. So that means it is time to think about how to survive our economic apparatus and network. So let me uh, start with um, uh, China things and then talk about the U.S. leadership and implication for our international relationship. Mr. Xi Jinping, president uh, the, of China, uh, has the, um, um, the long article which appeared in the party magazine, Kui Si, which titled, that is, it is time for collaborations and unity. He underlined the importance of the global community and the world destiny. And he tried to uh, declare, he tried to, uh, he tried to enhance collaboration with WHO, World Health Organization, and nothing would be hidden. And also, he highlighted the Chinese methods that the Chinese people remember how the world supported Chinese disaster last uh, January and March. But now, last week, Wuhan, where the pandemic started, declared that uh, they will level it and the uh, lockdown is over. And uh, also, uh, connectivity is back in China. Also, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping uh, proposed to have so-called a uh, silk road, health silk road. This is a part of Belt and Road Initiative. Not only infrastructure, not only money, but health care to Italy, Spain, and Africa. That means they are willing to promote Chinese soft power. The point is that China is a quite unique superpower, not only a provider of the, okay, um, the very cheap made in China products across the globe, including mask or the medical equipment, without the um, production of the Chinese factory, Japan cannot move. So we now realized the importance of the network, so-called supply chain. We depend a lot on Chinese uh, products, not only Japan, but the across the region. But not only supply chain, value chain matters. Financial care and network and idea. The idea, uh, the point here is that uh, China is pretty smart. And uh, Mr. Trump uh, criticized the WHO, which is too um, supportive to the Chinese activity. And uh, uh, yesterday, he declared the counseling with the 60% of WHO's funding for, um, the, from uh, USA, and which will have a very significant impact, a very negative impact on the multilateral image and also leadership image of the Mr. Trump. The point here is that think about the Africa. Africa has a long tradition of having ties with Chinese products and Chinese workers. According to one source, 
210 billion US dollars of debt, or sorry, of um, uh, economic uh, exchanges between China and African countries. This is the largest one. And now we are talking about how to have a healthy um, the economic growth for Africa or Middle East and also ASEAN countries. And uh, the idea is how to suspend the loans about the half year, one year. So that means G7 can have a little things, but G20's network quite need needed because China is the, uh, the one of the uh, provider of the credit for the African countries. So without the support and collaboration with China, we cannot move ahead. That's the reality, like it or not. Then I will talk about the leadership by the United States. And one is the one of the tragedy of the US Indo-Pacific strategy right now is that a military asset by the US in the Indo-Pacific region may be questioned. Number one issue is aircraft carriers. In our region, there are Theodore Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, which is in Japan, and also Nimit and Carl Vinson. These four aircraft carriers suffered from infection of the corona. So they suspended operational activities right now. So they are in the so-called maintenance mode. In that sense, if something happens, aircraft carrier of US in Indo-Pacific region cannot move, unfortunately. And you may remember the North Korean short-range missiles, four times, five times the uh, testing last month and this month. Of course, US has huge criticism about North Korean behavior, but these pressure cannot be felt by the Pyongyang. That's the reality. The thing is, uh, Chinese uh, A280 strategy, anti-denial or air denial strategy may be working. And also in the South China Sea, uh, we will have a shashi to talk about it later, I'm sure, but uh, uh, South in South China Sea, China has the uh, military exercises, and also Chinese aircraft carrier, Vietnam, passed our, uh, the, uh, the uh, near waters last week to have exercises. So uh, this is a kind of the, uh, the not the big uh, obvious um, the, uh, change, but it's a kind of the subtle changes, but very meaningful. So U.S. cannot have the big punch, like it or not. And China uh, deactivated the media operations either in the East China Sea and South China Sea. But in that sense, something is happening. Something, something is happening. Then uh, let me uh, move on to the last point about the how our international relations will uh, be changed. Uh, I'm very uh, unfortunate to say that uh, we have too many unknowns and uh, where the U.S. is moving. We are having a presidential, presidential elections in November uh, of the United States. And uh, we don't know, we, we don't have specific idea who will be upcoming. But the one thing is quite real, that the challenges of pandemic in the U.S. is real. Think about the what's happening in New York City and the hospital. And also there is a huge gap about the Mr. Trump's leadership and uh, the states like uh, New York and also uh, the, um, the, those who are in hospital. So in that sense, US may be experiencing another split, very, very deep split enough. Then having elections. So there's a good time for driving a wedge for uh, no US power, super power, uh, to drive a wedge between the domestic, or domestic, the opinion, and top leaders. Another one is that 
everybody is aware of the, the importance of multilateralism, but uh, showing in the case of the WHO issues, uh, US American conservative has a very uh, deep mistrust or suspicion about UN organization, unfortunately. And also we are having election in November. So uh, we must ensure that uh, multilateralism uh, multi, uh, or international cooperation is the key for success after Corona, but we don't know. We have so many unknown unknowns. November elections will be available? I don't know. So this is a golden time to share our uncertainties. So the uh, TV work, work, um, the TV conference like this is very important to know unknowns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, for a very rich and enlightening presentation. I think uh, some of the issues that you raised are, are very important, not, not only uh, in the regional uh, Asian Pacific, but also worldwide, since they are affected by the balance of power between China and, and the United States, and, and North Korea is still a big and very important issue. Um, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Shashi now, who I also thank for, for attending the, the invitation, for accepting the invitation. Uh, Shashi is uh, the only uh, presenter that I hadn't known before this opportunity, so nice to meet you. Shashi, it's great uh, to have you with us. It's a truly honor. Um, so I'll pass the floor to you. Uh, thanks so much. I think your your mic microphone is is not open, Shashi. I'm just trying to get this to work. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, now it's fine. Great. Thank you for the invitation to speak. I'm very happy to be here. I would also add that over the last 45 minutes, I've actually learned quite a lot. So thank you to the other speakers as well. I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle. I promise Giuliano, I know geopolitics is the focus here. I will spend one or two minutes on this right at the end. Let me speak about Singapore first and specifically the resilience story of Singapore. I think there are many Brazilians in the audience, correct me if I'm wrong, just to explain a little bit. Singapore is a country of 720 square kilometers. We are tiny. For comparison, we are half the size of Sao Paulo. Uh, very, very small. Resident population, 5.6 million. The citizen population, Chinese majority, as many of you know, 76% Chinese. Malays were Muslims, 15%. 8% Indians. We have not been independent for very, very long. We were thrust out of Malaysia. We were formerly part of Malaysia in 1965. This was a painful separation. We've always felt vulnerable. And the sense of fragility, if you like, has engendered a sense of political paranoia amongst the, the political establishment. So if you like, calculated paranoia is what has historically kept Singapore going, which has served us quite well in this pandemic period. So that, that's Singapore. Let me explain a little bit on our reaction to, to COVID. We've got 3,700 cases, 10 fatalities, mainly elderly, uh, a number of people, 650 who have been discharged, and quite a few, actually, over 1,500 were clinically well, but still test positive. I will tell you that we are actually battling two outbreaks. One is the outbreak within the community of Singapore citizens, where I would say, at least for the time being, this outbreak is being more or less contained. You've got 20 or 30 cases each day within this, this outbreak. But you also have foreign workers, mainly from South Asia, in the dorms. They, they live in dorms, mainly construction workers. And the numbers for them every day, newly reported cases, is about three, 400. So there are a number of cases in Singapore, the majority come from that group, who are crammed in conditions, depending on your point of view, which are precisely conducive to the spread of COVID. So it's on account of this 
that these people and the conditions that they live in, these are people who build Singapore, has come under scrutiny from, from people over the last, last few weeks. So the Manpower Ministry and the, the Ministry of Health are ongoing efforts to undertake active testing of, of them, which is a reason why the numbers for that group are, are high, but it's clear that that's the majority. We're in the middle of what is essentially a month long lockdown light. I call it lockdown light because the restaurants remain open. If you want to do takeaway, they can do delivery. Individuals can go around and exercise, although increasingly restricted in terms of where they can go. Wearing a mask has been made compulsory within the last few days if you go outside. In terms of communication and public discourse, attention has very much turned to obeying the various rules and regulations, displaying pro-social behavior and showing concern for, for others. And here, I don't think Singapore has, has done that badly. So that's what's going on in Singapore now. I want to explain a little bit about the, the response at the establishment level and the resilience of the systems. At the very beginning, in fact, before there was even one imported case into Singapore, we constituted our multi-agency government level task force looking into this. And I would say this is directly a responsible of Singapore, but also other countries have had the same experience. Singapore's experience, painful experience with SARS. And not just SARS, where we made many mistakes, but also for Singapore specifically, the government has been through a real crucible, if you think about it, beginning actually from the Asian financial crisis, 1997 through to 9-11, the resulting slowdown. And that period proved very, very testing. And the government came through in terms of that with trust intact with the, with the people. And I'm saying this because the Singapore government is something I know quite well. I'm a former government servant. And in terms of building trust, transparency with the people, this is something which is highly prioritized. If you just on one thing from my presentation today, look up the CNBC interview, and you can find this online, with the foreign minister. His name is Vivian Balakrishna, V-I-V-I-A-N, Vivian Balakrishna gave some time back at the beginning of the outbreak, and he says, and I quote, to respond effectively to COVID depends not just on the national health system, but, and I quote, the social capital of the country too, and has to overcome serious challenges like pandemics and good governance, unquote. And that's very, very telling. One thing we do have here is a leadership, which is, I, I think, generally speaking, trusted. I think all of us who look at geopolitics, which I think is everyone except for me, realizes that in Western societies, the levels of trust between people and government are, are generally on a downward slide, at least from the most respected surveys. But that's not the case in Singapore, if you look at the most respected surveys, including other men, but, but there are other surveys. So Prime Minister Lee, Lee Sien Lung is widely respected, he's popular. He has not made too many direct Actually, I think we lost your audio again. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I think we lost his internet probably connection. Yeah. Because it's all. Um, oh. uh, yeah, Shashi, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, uh, we lost you about uh, a minute ago. Uh, I, I Let think me we lost your again. camera. Uh, yeah, we lost your camera and then your audio. Yeah, it's on now. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, we can we cannot see you, but we can hear you. So if you wanna go on without uh, the image, that's fine. Uh, I don't know what. Okay, this what is very strange is. because I can see all of you and hear you very well. Uh, just to let me try again. I apologize for this because the internet is usually much more reliable in Singapore. We take great great pride in this. Nowadays, everyone's internet is getting into trouble because 
there is a lot of use at home so also so All right i'm yeah, glad to hear this not just uh, not just a singapore issue uh, just to uh -huh. confirm you can hear me you can hear me now yes, yes we, we hear you very well okay uh, I, I may need to continue with just the audio for the time being i hope you're able to bear with me and i apologize to the the audience members if there is an issue with the audio again please let me know if not i will carry on if that's okay okay thank you very much at critical moments, the Prime Minister has stepped in to provide information, and the way he's done, done it is in complete transparency, delivering information, including bad news, including unfiltered advice from medical professionals. So what you have is the Singapore leadership developing a clearly articulated vision in terms of information sharing in levels where, again, as a former government servant, I would say are quite unprecedented. For example, there's been some signs at one or two points that there might be some panic buying on account of food security concerns. At that point, the relevant ministers step in and give an unprecedented level of detail, information which has never been disclosed in terms of how much stockpiles we have in terms of rice and, and other staples, and indeed staples, and indeed how other relevant agencies are going from now on to be further diversifying uh, food resources, and indeed calming the ground by telling people how, in fact, planning for these kinds of contingencies has been going on for, for some time. So I would say the national sense of solidarity with the people is very, very important, and it's reinforced this sense of trust. So you've got a huge government stimulus, which has been rolled out, and then rolled out again a second time when it's become clear more is needed, and then rolled out again a third time in huge stimulus approximates to around $60 billion, Singapore dollars, and this includes drawing on our reserves, which is very, very unusual. It requires the agreement of the president, something which has been done very, very few times in our, our history. And this is necessary as the crisis has got more and more serious. There are incentives, not just for businesses in these budgets. Uh, unusually, the government payouts have also been credited directly into the bank accounts of citizens. And this crisis has therefore fostered solidarity and not disunion. The top level of the political establishment, who are the ministers, have taken a three-month pay cut. And the frontline workers at the forefront of the outbreak have in fact received a special bonus. I'm not saying that this solidarity is perfect. There have been some disturbing signs in the Chinese language press, for example. There have been letters by Singapore citizens, Chinese, who have written saying that these foreign workers in the domes brought this upon themselves because people from South Asia are generally unhygienic and so on and so forth. But I think it's to the credit of Singaporeans, including Singaporeans of all races, that they've come back to, to rebut this kind of uh, unfounded, ignorant kind of comments. I want to turn very briefly to something with which I study. I, I would appreciate your, your comments on this later, and that is disinformation and, and fake news. You look at the West in terms of the disinformation stakes, COVID-related rumors and false news, it has caused quite a great deal of polarization across the, the local a immigrant Asian divide and so on and so forth. There has been very little of this in Singapore, I think partly because we are a multicultural, polyglot, diffuse country, and the government, whenever it sees something which could impinge on race relations, steps in, and steps in very, very hard. It uses very, very tough laws. What the government has done is to connect itself to the people by WhatsApp. WhatsApp in particular is very popular in Singapore. Several hundred thousand people, close to a million, get updates daily which debunk false news. And the ability to debunk, I would say, has in fact increased. It's been reasonably quick. Since we are talking about geopolitics, I would tell you that the geopolitical aspect of fake news or subversive content, which you've seen in many, many parts of the West. For example, did this coronavirus come out of a lab in Wuhan? Or is it even a US bioweapon? Or is there something about 5G towers, the mask, to do, to deal with coronavirus? I would say this is very much a phenomenon in other parts of the world, in other theaters. Singapore, which by many measures is the most well-developed um, Southeast Asian nation, where internet penetration, mobile broadband is the highest, we are awash with information. But the kind of rumors I've just sketched out to you are not something which is great permeation or great traction in, in Singapore. I would add uh, something which is rather obvious to someone from Asia, but maybe for the benefit of the uninitiated, 
the Chinese Singaporeans who make up 75% of the Singapore population see themselves as quite different from the Chinese from China. And in, in, in many, many cases, the majority, there's several generations actually removed from, from China. Okay, Giuliano, I, I promised you I would talk a little bit about the, the international geopole. I'm going to disappoint uh, Tomonori and tell you I'm not a South China Sea expert. But I think some of what I've talked about on the disinformation stakes might be a nice segue into the wider geopolitical aspects. The misinformation blaming the West by Chinese officials, and indeed vice versa, to expand on what I've just said, Southeast Asia has not, generally speaking, been a theater for this type of information warfare. And I would go further. I'll be interested to hear your comments, Tomonori. It's not generally been a theater for this kind of influence game. Now, now mind you, we know very well from looking at the, the West, and perhaps in South America, I'm not sure, that there are Chinese representatives and there are Chinese embassies or embassy officials who have tried to influence various host governments. Uh, Germany comes to mind. The US officials at the state level also come to mind. Influence them in positive comments in terms of what China is doing, China's profile, how great China has been in terms of dealing with the coronavirus. They have tried, to my mind, to my observation, a bit less of this in Southeast Asia. There have been general statements by Chinese embassies in particular about Chinese willingness to help. ASEAN nations. When I say ASEAN, that's the Southeast Asian countries grouping. And some of the statements have actually come from the top, Xi Jinping himself, about willingness to help countries like Indonesia. And I would point out that some of this aid in terms of PPE has actually arrived from countries like China to Indonesia. Separately, these kinds of supplies have also gone to the Philippines. And in the case of the Philippines specifically, a Chinese medical team has, has been sent there. Not perhaps huge amounts of aid, but if you want to compare this or put it in contradistinction with the lack of any sort of U.S. President's, uh, presence, soft power or aid given by the United States, well, the, the discourse about poor quality of Chinese aid that you see in parts of the West really doesn't figure here, because in as much as anyone is giving any aid, it's actually the, the Chinese. So I'm going to attempt one or two final comments on the wider geopolitical arena. And one, this is a position taken by some Singapore diplomats. What has happened in terms of COVID? Who's needed it? Who's given it? And the, the nature of the, the mudslinging actually exposes the true nature of geopolitics. Even in the best of times, no nation is genuinely altruistic. International cooperation is at best somewhat, somewhat brittle. And I think Tomonori, uh, Ashok and Augusto, You've given comments in terms of what we make of the international scene moving forward. In closing, I do want to make a point that there is a wider debate, not just in geopolitics, but a wider slice of that, which is data surveillance and the authoritarian model. Those of us who follow information and those of us who follow cyber. Singapore has an app using Bluetooth. It traces people's links, traces their movements. It's been actually very, very good. Close to, I think, a million people have signed on. There are variations of this because this has been open sourced. So the wider question from these kinds of actions, quite innovative, taken by governments in order to make their population healthy, in order to do contact, contact tracing, the wider question is how much are people willing to surrender in order to, to stay safe, generally speaking, in surveillance states? And I, I think, you know, there's a cultural issue as well. Some cultures are much more accepting. How much are people willing in order to stay healthy? This is not an issue which is going to go away once COVID is, is done and dusted, either in a few months or maybe in, in a year. So for the surveillance state, I think there's a powerful argument to be made for saying that it's actually strengthened its hand in, in these times. But from the Singaporean point of view, where we are one of those many countries which in terms of disinformation, fighting fake news or global cyber debates played out in the UN, we haven't really come down on either side. The Californian Western liberal val values of freedom of speech and so on and the internet versus the Chinese or the Russian model of the splinternet. So I would suggest in closing that it's very, very important to attempt to find a balance, notwithstanding the fact that the authoritarian hand may well have been strengthened. I'm going to end that because I think I've outlasted my welcome, but I would of course welcome comments even as I try to restore visual contact with, with everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shashi. Um, 
it was very interesting to hear you about the, the importance of communication. I think we all uh, uh, know that a lot, but coming from a specialist such as you yourself, uh, it was very interesting. Um, I think now that I will open the floor to our uh, participants. We have, uh, uh, since we lost Shashi, you're going to have uh, bad news. You're going to see me now. now. <laughs> but uh, I'll open the floor to all participants, to everyone that's listening. If you want to pose questions uh, using the chat, that will be okay. I, I've, I've been uh, attentive to it. Uh, if not, if you want to open the mic, I would just ask you to be very brief on your comments and, and thoughts. I, uh, I I don't know if we're going to be able to go on for long, since Tom must be uh, very sleepy by now, but uh, I think we'll still have some time to hear you and to, to address your questions. So please, whoever wants to, to speak, we be free to do so. Uh, hi, may, may I pose a question to Mr. Ashok Swain? Yes, please. Ah, uh, yes. In fact, I want to know his view or his opinion about the Tablighi Jamaat issue in the context of the Indian Muslims, because I do not, I do not agree with his view. In fact, I tweeted him this morning too on this topic. So I only wish to know about his opinion or view on Tablighi Jamaat in Indian context. So please. Explain a bit. You. Could you just uh, state your country of origin, please, uh, when you pose the questions? Yes, yes. I belong to India. I am an Indian. I have been a professor in Spain before, yeah. But currently, I am residing in India. Thank you very much. Do you want me to go now? Yes, I think so. We are okay. still waiting for the yeah, those who don't know about this Tablighi Jamaat, uh, 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 those who don't know about the Tablighi Jamaat, uh, what is that? That's a religious Muslim religious cult which uh, originated uh, many decades ago in India, uh, but it has uh, wings uh, in different parts of the world, particularly in the Southeast Asia and also certain part of Middle East and North Africa. Uh, this uh, Tablighi Jamaat is a kind of uh, hardcore uh, Islamic cult. Uh, it, it's an organization meeting its headquarters in Delhi. What the uh, person is asking, I think, I believe your name is Dhiraj Kumar, uh, is that uh, this organization had a meeting uh, or con congregation. Uh, in Delhi from 13th to 15th of March. Uh, and that congregation uh, was uh, had, because people had come from the different parts part of Southeast Asia and also certain parts of Middle East. So that congregation brought certain kind of people, a number of people, those who were infected with the uh, coronavirus, and they are the one, those who went from that congregation to different parts of India. They're mostly, of course, Muslims. So they went to different parts of India. And the, the, the Indian government has been, Indian government and media and others, those who could really make it a story, saying that this is the organizations which brought coronavirus to India or spread the coronavirus to India. Uh, there are, uh, it's a partly true that this is the, uh, Tablighi Jamaat was uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, it has been to a certain extent, uh, brought these kind of issues to certain parts of India. Uh, of course, it's not exactly, I will agree that it has, uh, the all the cases have been connected to that. There are a number of things which Indian government should have act properly. Indian India is being the neighbor to China, would have realized that this is a problem. But the Indian government till 13th of March, was telling that it will not be a public health crisis. 13th to 15th March, this Tablighi Jamaat hold a congregation in Delhi, but Indian government had given the visa to these people, those who coming from the already COVID affected. The Indian government didn't stop that Tablighi Jamaat congregation when this Tablighi Jamaat was holding it was holding its congregation from the 28th of February to 1st of March in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And Malaysia has been complaining that this, because of that Tablighi Jamaat, 
the COVID has been uh, spreading in Malaysia. So they had two weeks before knew that this kind of uh, congregation brings to the brings this kind of spreading the uh, uh, COVID or coronavirus in Kuala Lumpur. Why did they didn't stop it uh, if they were really serious about it? Then uh, that's that's I think one thing we need to find out. Or we need to ask this question that the why whether the Indian government was serious about of about the COVID before. If they would have, they would have stopped this because they have they have all kinds of resources in their uh, uh, with their available and the people those who had come from outside with the coronavirus with them they could have tested or you couldn't have stopped their visa or you stopped the whole congregation. But it's a blaming the Muslims while you allowed also several of religious congregation of Hindus after that. So if religious congregations were stopped, stop all the religious congregation. If you want to stop any congregation, stop even political congregation. There have been a number of political meetings. Even the president had organized a breakfast meeting where some of the coronavirus people infected from coming connected with the uh, coming from London, they were also there. So if the president can call this kind of meeting, uh, why blame a particular organization, Tablighi Jamaat, for spreading the coronavirus in a country of 1.35 billion when the congregation was only 2,000 to 3,000 people? You didn't stop it first. You could have stopped it before. Then, if you would have stopped, you didn't stop it. You should have stopped. You should have stopped all the. You know, that is a, the rule that was supposed to be applied. And so it is. We instead of asking the Indian government that why it didn't take enough action to stop these people coming and spreading the virus, we are blaming the Muslims, 200 million Muslims of India. That's not fair. Uh, thank you, Ashok. I will just uh, turn to other questions, and I, I, uh, then uh, Ash can can come back on that if he wants. Uh, we have two questions uh, from different participants. Fernando Goular uh, is uh, saying that you highlighted the relevance of strong leadership, solid institutions to efficiently respond to the pandemic crisis, no matter if the country is power rich. That's interesting. That's an interesting variable. He says, how would theoretically be the impact of the epidemic in each country on its political leadership? And we have Musa Sangari uh, addressing Shashi's presentation uh, in which he mentioned the risk of a potential rise of our William states. The post 9-11 events turned the US state. How do we make sure that we do not end up there, he, he asks. So uh, I'll pass the floor first to Shashi on the question about the Aurelian states, and then I'll, I'll go back to, to Ashok, since he already spoke. <laughs> Good idea. Hello. Yes, go on, Shashi, we're hearing you. Not anymore. Uh, we cannot hear you now. So. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay, great. I apologize. I'm still trying to join the the webcam. I even applied to join it in low low quality, and I, I got to warn you. Even at the best of times, I, I don't look good even in, in medium quality. So may, maybe you're better off with just the the audio. The potential rise of Orwellian states and linking it to the U.S. is a very interesting one. I I, I will tell you from what I know about the U.S. and the way it treats the debates. That's not how I actually see the United States. There, there were, of course, important changes and refinements in the security establishment post 9-11. But there are powerful and influential voices right now in the, in the United States, which actually suggest that it actually has to push back against the rise of, let's say, authoritarian states, the way they try to control the information. Uh, for example, all you have to do is read Laura Rosenberger from the GMF think tank, her op-ed in Foreign Affairs, which has just come out in the last couple of days, and I highly recommend you read it because it summarizes the issues quite well. And one of the things she talks about in her op-ed is about these nations in the middle, and she calls them digital deciders, which I think is actually quite a good phrase. These are nations which are highly wired, which perhaps have a role to play in either the cyber or information debates, which are being courted actively by the, the major players, which in this debate would either be the United States or China. 
which have not yet made up their minds in terms of which way they, they want to tilt when it comes to the information or, or cyber. Cyber, I think those, those of us who follow these issues would be well aware that there are actually two separate and in two, so, some ways two competing resolutions or processes going through the United Nations right now. The UN Open-Ended Working Group, which is more of a Russian creation, and the UN Group of Governmental Experts. And they will talk about what's acceptable, what's, what are the rules of the road when it comes to important cyber debates. The problem is that these only very tangentially deal with information or cyber sovereignty. So in other words, there are no governance structures, no rules of the road when it comes to, for, for example, what should or should not be in a, in a fake news law. So if you look at the region I, I know very well, Southeast Asia, where Singapore, Vietnam, and, and Thailand have within the last year, year and a half, their, their own fake news laws, these go by different names. But depending on your own personal point of view, or perhaps your own political ideological uh, orientation, these could be seen as being very, very tough laws. I would also try to attempt to defend the Singapore law, but I don't think we have time to, to get into that. But at the extremes, and I'm not going to name countries, there are various countries which have basically decided the government gets to decide what is true and what is not true. From any reasonable perspective, it's important for nations to get together to discuss these issues and to accept, in my view, that there's no more return to the freewheeling Californian kind of libertarian role of the internet, which is anything which says goes, everything is fine. But you have to accept that the checks and balances you place must be balanced and limited in terms of how you control information. And that's a debate which is not really going on right now. So to, to take a micro perspective, look at what Singapore has done in the app that I, I mentioned. Even though we have enacted the app, we've not made it compulsory, we've heavily encouraged people and we say that if you sign on to this app, which is a COVID tracing app, the information will be de-anonymized and the government will not have access to the data in the app unless it's in an extreme case, unless they need to personally contact you. It's not by default you're sliding into to this orient, um, authoritarian or um, authoritarian mindset. So, I mean, I, I guess the final point I was making is that in all these debates about South China Sea, about geopolitics, who wins COVID and so on and so forth, the one thing which has not been talked about so much is information and information sovereignty. Why? China has not been saying, hey, we won, we, we're winning the game, everyone's cleaving to our side. And my point of view, they don't actually need to, because if you look at what's happening generally in Asia, but certainly in Southeast Asia, the secular drift is in that direction anyway. The secular drift is in the direction of control. So we need to watch that space very, very carefully. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashi. Pass the floor to Ashok. Um, thank you, Leon. Um, I think Fernando, you have very uh, Fernando, you have a very interesting question. Uh, it's it, it it takes back to this root of uh, what exactly uh, the leadership uh, role plays. Uh, the leadership, uh, a good leader, varies from country to country, institutions to institutions, the political system to political system. Uh, they are not exactly one brand for everything. You can't have. A, uh, the golden principle of that a good leader is not the golden there is no golden principle so it depends on what kind of institutions what kind of country what kind of uh, system they are playing uh, i think what i do see theoretically is possible that the country like which Sosi was mentioning in in, in singapore uh, a country where the political leadership wants to uh, has a, a, enough control uh, maintains a, a kind of control state uh, with a certain kind of uh, no challenge to itself or to its legitimacy, uh, at least uh, in the uh, as uh, openly, will be possibly playing a much better role of managing the crisis because managing the crisis at least. In a, in a way to stop the crisis, not to create all kinds of uh, uh, challenges, not to blame others, keep bringing a society together, uh, keeping it, uh, uh, not to create much more uh, anger in the society, that will help its uh, longevity of the region. So I think what I do see, the countries where non-democratic, authoritarian countries, 
not being challenged, the leadership is not being challenged, they will also do well. Democratic country, countries those who are progressive democratic countries have the leadership, the leadership which understands the democratic value, norms, the societal uh, principles, and also believes in what the experts are talking about. Uh, tries to listen to the experts, not making a political issue out of the uh, this sort of uh, uh, pandemic, pandemic or a disease uh, to make it political. They will be successful. Those who are also, we are seeing number of cases which I mentioned, they have been successful because the true democratic spirit, the country which are the good institutions, the leadership understand, leadership knows that this is the way they can't play politics. The countries where the leadership really can mess it up is so-called so semi-democracies. In the democracies where we have elected so-called nationalist or ultra-nationalist leaders, those who are projecting themselves as strong men, they are neither uh, good to the science, they have never been, because science and the strong men do not really match ideologically. So they first, they will not really listen to the science. They will not try to listen to the experts. They will always try to see that it is somehow they are should be on the forefront. They are the one who looked at looking at uh, taking the decisions, and they will be always trying to divide the society crisis because they know that in the semi-democracy they need certain number of political base to keep them re-elected. And I think that's where I do see a leadership, particularly in these kind of problematic semi-democracies are really extremely important. They can break or make the society. If the leadership is good in these kind of, uh, you know, the struggling democracy, they, they can do well. If the leadership is bad, really looking at into a very troublesome future ahead, and they are looking at it now. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Ashok. I have a question from uh, Luiz Alberto Martins Salles. Uh, he's from Brazil, and he has a question to Professor Tomonori uh, on the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, stating that it was a paramount event for Abe's uh, policy to stimulate Japanese economy, which now seems to have been funneled to aid packages uh, through direct money distribution to Japanese nationals and more recently mm -hmm. subsidies for Japanese companies to shift production from China to Japan. Taking into account that previous economic policies such as Abonomics were relatively unsuccessful in launching a sustained GDP growth despite the massive public debt uh, incurred. Could it be that the window of opportunity open to co uh, open COVID-19 may provide the needed stimulus for Japan's economic growth and change uh, the economic geopolitical landscape in Northern Asia away from China? Thank you very much, uh, your question, Louis. And uh, uh, let me start with the current um, status of the infection in Japan. The number of infection is uh, 8,700 and uh, about 170 deaths. And compared to other uh, country in this region, compared to Korea or China, uh, the damage is simply very, very limited. And they, you might think that we are very successful in containing the infections. But please do remember that the la up until last week, we waited at the, um, up until the last moment about the declaration of emergency. And the emergency declaration was the first in our history. And it was very, very costly. And uh, we had a huge debate before releasing this decisions. Now, public said that decision was a bit too late, but the please highlight two important uh, reasons why we were very cautious. Number one issue is apparently the Olympics games. We were 
on the top gear of uh, the preparation for the Tokyo Olympic Games, uh, having a huge stadium and a new platform for the stations and air, airports and many of the hotels. So in, we invested a lot already. So it was very painful for the metropolitan government of Tokyo and also Japanese government to stop it. But uh, we have to do it. That's number one. Number two uh, unexpected event was that Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, Chinese presidents, were expected to come to May. Finally, due to the COVID crisis, it was canceled. That means uh, we tried to have a, um, the, the uh, cooperative relationship in order to have a better management of our a volatile relationship. So this spring was a very important and very chaotic situation. Uh, and uh, so the Olympics game and Chinese, uh, our relations, very forward relations, but uh, we had a chance to amend that gap. But uh, eventually it was canceled. The Mr. Xi Jinping's uh, visit to Tokyo was canceled. So it is simply unfortunate. So please, uh, do understand that. And as to the economic package or stimuli, a stimuli, we do believe that the 20% of GDP should be enough to stimulate the, our uh, the COVID-19 damaged economy. And uh, but the point here is that, as uh, Shashi pointed out, that uh, uh, democracies maybe uh, is, is not a very good the governance style to make a quick decision in time of crisis because it is not the war situation. We don't call it uh, the war situation. Uh, France and US might call it war situation, but we are uh, having a kind of cautious, like a, uh, the wording, the expressing this is healthcare, healthcare. This is not the uh, military or defense or security challenges, no. So, so our the uh, the challenge here is that uh, in time of crisis, who, who will be in charge of many situations? And everybody understands that uh, we have a common challenges of COVID, but the, our routine standard operation procedures, starting from a healthcare and local government, and many 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 layer of decisions. This is not suitable for crisis management. So back to your questions, uh, whether or not the Japanese package, economic st stimuli package will uh, have a chance. I, 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 I hope we can do it, but uh, the challenge here is that uh, we cannot make a quick decision. And this is a typical Japanese uh, problem. And uh, now, uh, metropolitan government and national government would like to amend that gap, but uh, we have a lot of love the challenges ahead. So I'm uh, rather pessimistic about that. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, it's interesting that uh, the debate is addressing both the, the national and international levels of analysis when, when putting uh, difficulties to uh, leadership inside each each uh, different state, but also uh, the lack of leadership internationally. So I'd, I'd like to hear more from you and spe specifically from Augusto uh, on the difficulties that he sees uh, internationally speaking. Is this uh, related to the moment in which we live in? Uh, that is not a strong leadership coming from the United States, the America first idea. Uh, or is this a challenge that will probably be repeated in the future when we have uh, a different person in the American presidency? Um, and do you think that this, uh, this uh, lack of uh, uh, strong leadership in the international system is also related to uh, the lack of trust in uh, democracies worldwide? Okay, uh, thanks for, for the question, Giuliano. So I think it's very important to address that issue. 
Uh, first of all, uh, as I stated, problems that uh, uh, are going to be fastened or catalyzed by the pandemic uh, were already in motion previous to the crisis. If we think uh, of the, the critique about the global order or the costs of enduring it by Trump, I think honestly that there will be uh, worsened in the, uh, uh, the next months because uh, for his discourse that the idea of America first is not only an electoral slogan, is a, an idea of policy. If we think of uh, Walter Mead's idea of uh, probably uh, change and uh, grand, grand strategy uh, in American way of, of thinking and doing or politics, uh, the idea of changing the basis of this liberal order in the sense of giving motion a more fragmented world based on nationalism is a strong idea that has uh, strong ties in a, a great electorate inside the US and not only in the US, but in several places around the world. If, and if we add to that, the idea that we are in transformation in terms of polarity uh, or the idea that maybe a multipolar world that's giving, uh, that is on the rise right now uh, is an idea that strengthens the trends of a more sense of nations, regions and uh, regions, powers, powers and rivalries may have more to do in terms of how to deal with crisis and post-crisis than necessarily multilateralism and global institutions. Uh, the idea of Trump of retrieving uh, the uh, World Health Organization uh, funds of, uh, from, uh, of US funds is very uh, striking in that sense because it's not only a political signal in terms of uh, UN uh, HMS and China, but it's also uh, a, a signal in terms of showing this position of weakening multilateral uh, multilateralism and its in its institutions. In that sense, uh, we depend strongly on how American election is going to go, uh, because if Trump has more four years in term, uh, another administration. To deepen the changes in the sense of repositioning the U.S. and the global stage uh, is a, another kind of grand strategy. Is another kind of seeing international politics and geopolitics not only about the place of the U.S. in a multi multipolar order, but how to address with uh, the global presence of the United States. In that sense, I think uh, honestly that COVID-19 uh, strengthens that trains that were already in motion previously and gives birth probably to a world of nationalism, a world fragmented and a more weak international order in the sense of the answers probably will be more national, more uh, uh, sensitive to national electorate, not only in the US, but in China and in other countries. In that sense, countries like Brazil uh, has a great problem to deal in the sense that we depend, we depend internationally on how we are inserted in the global value chains that are now disrupted. And the crisis in, in its natural uncertainties uh, gives more strength to the fact that we do not have a strategy. We do not have a, a way out of that to now. It's very interesting to hear our colleagues from Japan, from India, from Singapore, in the ways that their national governments are trying to speed up the pace in the sense of giving answers to the crisis, not only to the crisis itself, but how to manage to give answers for a post-COVID-19 crisis. For in, in the case of Brazil, till now, we do not have any good sign of a go, a, a going out strategy in that sense. And that's a real problem, not, I think, not only in Brazil, but in Latin America uh, as a whole, probably. 
because we are a very dependent region, not only in terms of economy, but investments, and we have a, a very problematic uh, fiscal deficit, not only in Brazil, but in the region. In that sense, that being said, uh, the after uh, 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 crisis, China probably will be in a, a material good condition to use the, that power vacuum that not only the retraction of the US in terms of a more robust presence internationally, but in a region that does not really care about uh, the, the importance of democratic values and things like that when you need foreign investment to boost the economy like in Brazil and other countries in the region. So in that sense, Latin America and Brazil uh, will be continued a region important in terms for access for China to middle near the US in terms of positioning for Russia to middle in Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua in terms of balancing the US if it needs and in terms of a region that has something to sell that the world knows, that will probably uh, tend to not buy so much, that is commodities. So in that sense, we have a really deep crisis uh, that we are heading to, that we not have a, a, a comprehensive view of how deep it is, and we do not have a good stretch in terms of how to address it. Uh, in, it's not a problem of COVID necessarily, it's a problem of order, transformation, and a problem of uh, changing in the way that order is structured and shared among nations. We are not prepared for that in Brazil, Unfortunately, uh, we had a plan. We don't have a plan uh, nowadays. Thanks for the opportunity, Julian. Thank you very much. I have two more uh, questions here in the chat. And uh, after the, well, during the next uh, talk, uh, we will close uh, questions since we are uh, with more than uh, one hour and 45 minutes of event. Uh, so during the last the, the next uh, answer uh, please uh, bring us the the last questions and then we'll close uh, we'll close up everything as we can see shashi again uh, nice to see you shashi uh, so we have a question from mila campbell uh, from the brazilian mod um, i would like to hear your comments regarding a possible movement of securitization of medical equipments there are now scars with recirculation and treated nationally as strategic products, generating even industrial reconversion movements similar to war economies. Uh, and a, a question from uh, Piopin uh, from India. If I can ask a question about the death of the US association with the right-wing administration in India. Specifically, are the US interests purely economic in nature, like countering China, migration or of labor force and engaging in the Indian market. Uh, Indian is traditionally not a natural ally, uh, ally from uh, other superpowers. So is that uh, changing now in India, strongly aligning with US interests uh, or uh, is this just uh, a guise of countering radical Islam? Thank you. So I'll pass the floor to either of you who wants to answer the, the question on securitization of medical equipments. And then I think uh, Asha could uh, tell us a little more about China, China's uh, uh, role in the relation between India and the US, or, or if that's uh, long-term change in the Indian uh, international policy. Thank you. Hello. Yes, uh, Shashi, would you like to, to go on in the security? Maybe, maybe I can offer some intro introductory thoughts. I'm hardly an expert on medical equipment, but I could maybe venture to expand the question a, a little bit. We, we lost uh, your your eight audio shashi can you hear me now yeah you can hear me now 
I think many nations would be led to consider or reconsider what should actually constitute their national strategic stockpile. And I think that's going to be very, very important in, in, in time to come. So medical equipment is certainly one, your stockpile of ventilators and your indigenous production capability. I think that's going to come to the fore. But there are other things as well, which nations have been forced to relook and food security is, is clearly one. And diversification of your source supply for what you cannot indigenize for food security, food supply, and also your, your medical production is going to be very, very important. So to track back to the geopolitical question, we've been turning back to this question all the time. I think uh, the real win for, for China, if indeed we're talking about win, We lost you again, Shashi. Now you're back. Uh, cannot hear you again. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I think the, the, just to conclude, the real wins for, for China, if there are any, will be not so much now because you've seen all the accusations of poor quality equipment and so on and so forth. But if it decides that uh, medical equipment, food security is an important part of its power play, geopolitical power play, may be tied into the Belt and Road in not just the years, but decades to come. If it makes a concerted effort to tie in this to its wider vision of soft power exercise, and this is something which will really fundamentally change the geopolitical stakes. Not so much what it is doing now, but how it can influence and impact the geo, geo, geopolitical, geostrategic um, calculus of various other client states in terms of providing what they cannot indigenously manufacture and stockpile. Thank you very much, Shashi. Uh... Ashok, would you like to go on uh, the question about Indian uh, foreign policy? Uh, I don't have your audio here, uh, Ashok. I don't know if all participants can hear you or not. Uh, no, we cannot hear you yet. Um, if you could turn uh, your audio off and back on, I think that might work. Not yet. I can see uh, you speaking, but I cannot hear you. Nothing yet. Uh, while we try to fix uh, Ashok's uh, audio, I would like to ask uh, the other participants uh, to give us some final thoughts on, on the debate today. Uh, so, Augusto, if you if you can can you can you hear me now? Yeah, now now it's fine. So, Asha, okay. going back to you. Sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. I think something was uh, technically the issue. Um, very quickly, I think uh, about the medical equipments. Again, it goes to the kind of leadership we have and the kind of leadership really managing this issue. That's what really making this uh, uh, movement of the medical uh, equipments, and that's. At this time, again, I would think at the global level, you probably needed something of a WHO and others like this, International UN, to play also an important role, how, where, which is needed. Uh, it could be really adjusted on the basis of the demand, but that also international community has failed to deliver. Uh, then coming to going to the Indian case, I think it's... it's uh, uh, I think it's 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 important uh, to understand the little bit of how what is going on between India, US, and uh, China. 
Uh, India has been for many years now, at least for a couple of decades, has been trying to maintain a balance between how, how you know, about, like a working relationship with China, working friendship, they have a number of issues, but at the same time keeping uh, US in good humor because uh, India used to be in the Cold War period close to Russia or Soviet Union, but then uh, for the last two decades, India has moved to United States quite closely. Uh, but what has happened in the last five, six years when Narendra Modi government came to power, it has been uh, kind of uh, moving the uh, goalpost because India has uh, really stopped playing that kind of balancing role and went quite closely with the United States. And in the beginning, I think India probably had assumed that it will be a, an economic power quite uh, to the match of China quite fast, and then it just, you know, it has to be better off with the uh, United States. Uh, so they signed an agreement where the United Indian Air Force base and uh, military bases could be used by United States. Um, India didn't join the uh, G's favorite project, uh, Belt Road program. Um, so there have been several ways India has tried to keep uh, the kept uh, China um, um, or upset China. So the U.S. relationship, uh, of course, uh, even before Trump came in, the Modi's relationship with Obama was uh, on the basis of pure national interest because U.S., as I understand, looks at China, uh, looks at India as a certain kind of uh, balancing factor, particularly to the to China in the South Asian region, because U.S. completely understands that India's limited role will be only limited to the South Asian region and the Indian Ocean. So I think that's why the, the United States is playing uh, uh, the politics with India uh, to keep uh, maintaining a balance with China. Uh, but the question is, uh, India's economy hasn't really matched up. India, I was making a calculation, if the present economic growth before COVID comes up, uh, came up, if the kind of economic growth China will continue and India will continue, it will probably take 125 years for India to catch up with China. That's not to you and I will not be there to see it. So the question goes, uh, India would have been a much better place to play a balancing role, not to create a kind of uh, enemy front with China, which it has. Of course, they have certain kind of relationship which keeps, you know, so, um, goes on, some kind of business interest goes on. But what is happening? By annoying China, China has now almost surrounded India with its ally in South Asia. And that's a problem that uh, India has lost almost all its ally in South Asia. Of course, India, China and Pakistan, they have been close much before, but China has, uh, India has lost all, almost all the allies in neighboring countries. And th the, the, the Indian economy is not doing well. India is uh, trying to create two fronts. One vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan is always alive, always uh, volatile, and then you know uh, you 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 uh, you create another front in the China side. And India, of course, there has been a lots of discussions that we can really take on, or we means the Indian Army can take on the two fronts at the same time, which is absolutely nonsense. It doesn't really tell the real story what is going on on the ground. So I think India should have maintained a balance of power, balancing relationship between China and the India, US, which it has failed. US is looking completely at India to balance China in the South Asia. I don't think it is looking at to create any kind of, uh, you know, against the um, 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 Islamic fundamentalists, because that's something which they are much more uh, want to do in the North Africa and uh, in the Middle East. So I think it's a in the American relationship uh, strategically with India just towards China. But the Trump has also found another relationship where he finds it's a politically beneficial to ally with Modi because of Indian diaspora living in the United States, which has become much stronger which has be traditionally used to vote for more Democrats, which had a lot of funding available because in Indian diaspora or Hindu diaspora in the in, in US is almost matching the Jewish diaspora. So I think that's the reason where Trump sees the benefits of befriending um, Modi uh, at, the point, at this time. So 
this is this is that's where I see it. Uh, but that's not going to last long. Uh, you know, know what will happen after November. But I think it's a very short term, very uh, non-strategic, non-futuristic relationship, just based on a few diaspora, few resources at a particular leader. Thank you very much, Ashok. Uh, we have a last question from Horacio Amalio from Brazil. Um, he observes that in various forum, uh, for uh, people from different areas sees that the world, uh, that this would be an opportunity for China to fill the gaps in power or indeed to replace the US as a global superpower. However, do any of you believe that the opposite is possible? which is uh, a more aggressive uh, approach by one or by a group of countries against China to the point of weakening it in terms of uh, material capabilities and influence. So that would be uh, our last uh, question. I would like uh, to hear uh, all of you about your final thoughts on the issues debated today also. So if you all could speak for uh, two to three minutes. I know that's very quick, but we have two hours of debate already on, on the main issues we debated. Uh, so I, I would start with uh, Shashi, which was the last one to, to present. Uh, I would give the floor to Shashi and then to Tomonori, uh, to Ashok, and finally to Augusto. Please. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. This is going to be a very testing and troubling time for, for Singapore in the wider region. We have not been severely affected compared to some of the neighboring countries, but there's so much that we, we, we don't know about. We don't know how long this will last. And if it goes away, we don't, if it goes away, we, we don't know whether it's going to come back in 30 years time or if it's going to come back in three years time. So if you look at the nature of how resilience discourse has historically played out in Singapore. We're quite good at dealing with terrorism threats. We're quite good at scenario planning and government preparedness. For the first time, we need to think that the real kinds of threats that might actually sink us in Singapore is not terrorism, it's not a cyber attack. It might be threats that exist in the, in the gray zone. I mean, I'm inventing this word, gray zone, so to speak. Disinformational threats coupled by something else, maybe pandemic, so on and so forth. I think the national security architectures of various countries, not just Singapore, need a serious relooking. And some of us who have been following this would be, I think, quite familiar with the emerging op-eds and also academic literature, which suggests that from now on, national security architectures and services also need to put pandemics and other gray zone threats like disinformation on the same par that they do with geopolitical threats on the same part that they do with, uh, let's say, cyber or disinformation attacks. And I think that's going to be very, very important in terms of rewiring uh, security establishments. In, in terms of China, we, we're talking in this vocabulary or language of China being, being a threat. And I can understand why various nation states and various think tanks indeed come together. And there are many of them in their, in their chat groups, uh, social media, and talk about China as a threat. But, uh, from the Southeast Asian perspective, it's also been a tremendous force for good, notwithstanding what they've done in the South China Sea, which I thoroughly disagree with. They have successfully filled in the space vacated by the U.S. in the absence of U.S. soft power. And quite apart from pandemic aid, they have developed infrastructure. They have assisted various, various governments in, in various ways. So when we cast this in binary terms, oppositional terms, China bad, U.S. good, and I'm not, I, I, no one is saying that. But the discussions I've been part of elsewhere have become a little bit like that. You see why this is problematic from the Singapore point of view. We've always tried to be friendly to the United States. We tried to be friendly to China. Uh, but things have become so polarized, particularly, I think, in the United States establishment and with their think tanks. When Singapore leaders, officials, counsel in their speeches, moderation, balance and great power relations, equilibrium, Things have become so polarized that the very act of sitting on the fence is itself taken completely the wrong way, is itself perceived as having taken sides with the, the other side. And this is going to become very, very difficult for countries like Singapore 
is trying to preserve this dynamic equilibrium. And I don't think COVID is going to make it any better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, Tom, could you follow on that, please? Yes. Um, my idea is about um, counter strategy uh, of the post corona is like this. The one of the lesson is that we have depended too much on China's supply chain. And once the, this supply chain is blocked or suspended, other network like automobiles or iPhones and some other would be damaged. So the, our counter strategy to get over it is be a kind of cloud network and uh, another supply chain, not to depend too much on a, uh, the uh, cheap goods, but that we should have a kind of alternative network and we, we must ensure the open regionalism not to depend on single uh, supplier or single cheap supplier. And we should have an alternative route of when something happens. So one of the agenda of uh, discussion for ASEAN and Japan and other major country would be uh, how to have a complementality of this kind of regional supply chain and value chain. And uh, let me uh, conclude with the uh, securitization things. And this is quite critical. You may remember that uh, Mr. Trump uh, tried to coin this crisis like a China virus crisis or Wuhan crisis. And uh, China responded in a rather different manner that the US military in Wuhan split the virus instead. We don't know the reality, but uh, this is a kind of the sharp power uh, try to have an agenda setting and try to discredit other superpower. This is not a very product productive process, but that's the reality. So our counter strategy uh, to bring the two superpower back in is to have transparency and connectivity back in and that will be the best hope for our future strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. I would pass the floor to Ashok now for his final comments. And if you want to address the uh, question on, on China uh, also, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you. Hear yeah, okay, well, that's good. Um, I think uh, uh, this is uh, the question which we need to uh, ask. Will it, uh, some things, uh, China will get a free pass or China will be uh, getting um, uh, an opposition which is probably some parties coming together to give, uh, not to give the China, which I think seriously lack the moral compass to lead the world. Uh, and I think this is where the real challenge lies. Uh, the question is, uh, there are a few obstacles to it. The, the, the world which is supposed to come together hasn't come together, the free world, because there have been lots of uh, differences. The leadership is not exactly bringing them together. Uh, and this is kind of things which are happening. The real problem is, even if that leadership changed, the real problem is, I think, do we have the world has this kind of ideological parameter to com confront China? Because what would have happened in the, uh, in the 1950s and 60s, we had two ideological base. One was a communist world, other was a free democratic world. Uh, but that is not there anymore because nobody is talking about that the, the type of uh, leadership, the type of authoritarian uh, regime which exist or non-democratic regime exist or not other. So we are not really talking about the kind of quality or the, the character of the political institutions. And that's what I think one of the main uh, problem is that on what basis the countries, those who want to really confront China, whether it will be an ideological one or just pure on economic terms. If it's pure on economic terms, China will have an upper hand. If it's a pure military terms, probably China will have an upper hand because China is maintaining quite a good collaborative relationship, particularly with Russia. 
So China, Russia coming together will have an upper hand sooner with the militarily. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting and important question for the rest for the whole, rest of the world to understand what sort of uh, challenge China will get if the China will get a democratic uh, human based on human rights, based on the uh, the civil rights, based on the protection of the uh, the minority, all these kind of issues, if the countries can come together, then I think China can be kept in its place and there is a global coalition can build to keep China in, in that situation. So this is where time will tell what kind of uh, uh, way we, we are moving, the world will move in the near future. Uh, but the present scenario, the kind of leadership which are in the opposite side of the China now, it doesn't that kind of hope, that kind of uh, uh, impression we don't get. Uh, so I think, but but my overall feeling is that of course we are quite resilient as as as, as, as uh, uh, human beings. Uh, we will probably find certain ways of uh, uh, surviving this and coming out of it uh, sometime. But very in very near future, the kind of crisis it is and the post crisis situation. To me, it doesn't really look good. So I think we should really, uh, those who are ho hoping in the last few years that we will soon get into a good, uh, at least some kind of uh, uh, better time in the global politics, probably we need to wait for some more years and some more decades to look for it if, we are, if I survive. Uh, thank you. Thank you for organizing this, Juliano. It, it, it has been extremely interesting to discuss with uh, all the panel members and with you and with the um, members of uh, those who are listening and the uh, audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashok. Uh, I'll pass the floor directly to Augusto. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I'm having a little problem with the internet here, so I won't be able to use my webcam. But uh, first, uh, the first thing I would like to say in terms of final remarks is that uh, probably one of the greatest lessons that the, the current crisis uh, teaches is the fact that uh, uh, geopolitics is not in change in terms of its nature. Geopolitics is not coming to be something Think that it wasn't before. Uh, in the practice, geopolitics is here as it will always were uh, a power struggle involving power, territory, position, and the ability to use space in order to uh, advance political interests. In that sense, uh, the current crisis, I think, it teaches the world that probably the world order structurally based and multilateralism institutions and shared values may to its limits, or maybe it was a good dream that the international community had for the last uh, decades. In that sense, uh, the actual uh, landscape in which geopolitics plays is a landscape uh, is strongly characterized by balance of power dynamics, by the work, uh, 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 potential for harnessing, and uh, the probable world which regionalism and nationalism uh, will be uh, more strengthened in terms of how we'll manage to answer uh, global problems. In that sense, uh, in, uh, in a great manner, uh, the world that we are living in, and probably the world that we will live in the next years uh, to come, will be a world more fragmented, a world in which its prime uh, country, or it's the Asian of the US, probably will lack the will to lead, not the lack the resources to it, but the will in terms of repositioning itself, in terms of which place and what function it wants as in the international arena. In that sense, uh, I think, honestly, that nationalism uh, will be a strong uh, trend in that sense. If we see, for example, how the United uh, the European Union gave response to the crisis is very illustrative in the sense of uh, seeing how national responses were quicker, more stronger, and it's in 
to wage uh, uh, more uh, important than the ability of the European Union in terms of solidarity and agility. In that sense, uh, honestly, I think the, 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 the crisis, the current crisis, teaches us very acutely that German politics is here to stay. Balance of power is probably a trend that will block how states will act and think in terms of strategic uh, reason. And more importantly, the, uh, the order that probably will be constructed in the next years based on the impact of the current crisis will be an order strongly influenced by uh, multipolarity, a world that will see uh, several power poles that will probably compete, not necessarily a world war violent in which war and conventional war will turn apart our days and our lives, but a world where competition will be a more uh, a structured and enforced trend than uh, traditional cooperation as we have seen for the last uh, decades uh, of the, the last century. Mm, uh, that said, uh, my final remarks about this uh, is a little bit pessimistic, but a little bit realistic uh, in, that, uh, in saying that the world that we are going to live is a problem that we are not prepared to it, but a world that our theories, literature, and diplomatic tradition in several countries already alerted us on how to navigate on the turmoil. In that sense, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, in terms of final remarks, thanks a lot, Juliano, not only for the, the opportunity and the invitation, but the opportunity to learn a lot uh, during this day uh, with the other colleagues all, all around the world and with the audience, Davis, uh, very important uh, questions, not only about international politics, but about trends and possibilities of the dystopian future like really in certain countries may not be too distant of that dystopian uh, reality. So I'd like to thank you all and I expect that we can uh, 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 say, uh, continue this debate later in other opportunities. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Augusto. Um... I would like to thank you all for, for accepting the invitation, uh, Ashok, uh, Augusto, uh, Tomonori, and Shashi. It was a great debate. I think that we, we all uh, understood that we are in a, in a period with a, a combination, a very difficult combination of greater challenges. We've had uh, climate change, terrorism, migration, uh, the era of fake news, and uh, a growth of inequality uh, be because of all those issues, a growing distrust in, in democracy, uh, and in uh, that very difficult melting pot, we uh, are facing now uh, the most difficult pandemic of the last century. Uh, instead of uh, cooperating more to solve not only one, but all of these issues, combined, apparently nationalism has been growing. We've had, a, uh, we ha we ha we've had less cooperation. We've been having uh, a stretch in, in, in international rivalries. So uh, I, I fully agree with uh, your pessimistic views on, on the current international system. But I think that there's always hope that we can come out of this situation with a different view of, uh, of the world, with a different view, not only uh, in international relations, but also in individual interactions. Uh, I've seen that uh, from an, a different standpoint, we've, have, we've been f having more uh, donations from companies, from individuals, we've uh, had a, a more uh, concerned view on, on international inequality, uh, on poverty, on how the African countries that we didn't mention a lot will face this pandemic. Uh, so I see that uh, although there are many, many reasons for us to be pessimistic about the current international situation, uh, there is also hope. 
So I would like to, to finish this meeting with, uh, 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 with some words of, uh, uh, with some more, some more optimistic uh, words so we don't uh, get out of this uh, chat room uh, depressed, right? I think that we are all at home, we're, we're all alone in our houses. <laughs> So if we if we don't um, if we don't think some uh, about some optimistic uh, signs, we can all uh, be depressed, and that's not good in the moment that we are uh, in right now. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for uh, for the audience for watching us. Uh, uh, we've had a very interesting uh, group of speakers, but not only that, a very interesting group of uh, listeners too. Uh, a lot of good questions, and I, I do hope we can uh, have an opportunity to repeat this uh, this experience in, in a more uh, in a more positive way and in a more positive scenario in the near future. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, listening to you. I learned a lot. I think that uh, the audience uh, has also learned a lot from your thoughts and from your comments. Uh, thank you. May you have a good night in Asia, a good afternoon in, in Europe, and let, let's hope we have a good day in, in Good Brazil. day. Thank you, Giuliano. Thank you very Thank much. You. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Goodbye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.